imagine trying to count every grain of sand on a beach, or every star in the sky. Just as vast and incomprehensible is the world of chemistry, where we think about tracking and measuring individual particles like atoms, molecules, and formula units. This is where the concept of the mole comes in. Originating from the mind of Amadeo Avogadro, the mole provides us a way to bridge the gap between the microscopic world of particles and the macroscopic world of measurable quantities. Like a baker who counts their pastries in sets of dozens, a chemist will count particles in sets of moles, where one mole represents 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. In this video, we'll explore some of the many applications of the mole in chemistry, from understanding empirical formulas to determining molar concentration and using mole ratios of gases. Recall that a molecular formula shows us the number of each type of atom present in a particular compound. For example, one glucose molecule contains six atoms of carbon, 12 of hydrogen, and six of oxygen, covalently bonded together. As we noted earlier in this video, it's virtually impossible to work with, track, or even measure individual atoms like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or even one molecule like glucose. However, we can work with and measure one mole of glucose, which weighs a more practical 180.18 grams. One mole of glucose molecules would contain six moles of carbon atoms, 12 moles of hydrogen atoms, and six moles of oxygen atoms. Although the molecular formula gives us a complete accounting of the numbers of each type of atom present in the compound, it could be useful to understand the concept of empirical formulas. The empirical formula represents the simplest ratio of atoms of each element present in the compound. In the case of glucose, the 6 to 12 to 6 ratio simplifies to 1 to 2 to 1. Empirical formulas provide fundamental information about the composition of chemical compounds and play a key role in various aspects of chemistry, from stoichiometry and reaction analysis to substance identification and qualitative analysis. Before diving into empirical formula calculations, let's quickly take a look at the concept of percent composition using glucose. Our table outlines how we can calculate percent composition for a compound we already know. We take the moles of atoms of each element times their molar mass, and divide that by the total mass of the compound to find the mass percent composition of that element in the compound. We can total up our values to check our work. The total masses of the atoms of each element add to the molar mass of glucose, and the percent composition of each element adds to 100%. In the lab, we can use the mole concept along with percent composition to determine an empirical formula of an unknown compound. Here's a sample problem. A compound contains 43.7% of phosphorus and 56.3% of oxygen by mass. What is the empirical formula of this compound? Remember, the goal is to find the lowest whole number mole ratio of oxygen and phosphorus in the sample. To do this, we'll follow three steps. First, we'll assume that we have a 100 gram sample of the compound. Since mole ratios within a compound are independent of how much of the compound we're actually using, we could start with any mass of sample. Starting with 100 grams is mostly out of convenience, since our percentages would directly translate into mass. We would have 43.7 grams of phosphorus and 56.3 grams of oxygen in our 100 gram sample. From here, we'll determine the number of moles of each element present. We'll take the mass of each element in the sample and divided by the respective molar mass, which we find using the periodic table. Finally, we'll take these molar values and find the lowest whole number ratio. This last step can feel the most complicated. A simple trick is to divide each value by the lowest moles you have available. In this case, that would be the 1.41 moles of phosphorus. Doing this gives us a 1 to 2.5 mole ratio between phosphorus and oxygen. We're not quite done yet, since this is still not a whole number ratio. Mathematically, the closest whole number to 2.5 is 5, which we get by multiplying the value by 2. This means we'll multiply both mole values by 2, giving a 2 to 5 mole ratio between phosphorus and oxygen, and our empirical formula of P2O5. 
We can go one step further from the empirical formula if the molar mass of a compound is known. For example, a compound containing carbon and hydrogen is determined to have the empirical formula CH2 if the molar mass of the compound is known to be 98.21 grams per mole, what is the molecular formula of the compound? To relate an empirical formula back to a molecular formula, we'll first need to determine the molar mass of the empirical formula. We'll add together the molar masses of each atom of each element based on the values found on the periodic table. Then, we'll compare the empirical mass to the molecular mass. If we divide the molecular mass by the empirical mass, we see that it is seven times the size. This means the mole ratio, and therefore each subscript in the molecular formula, must be seven times that of the empirical formula. This gives a molecular formula of C7H14. As you've seen now and will continue to see throughout your study of chemistry, mole calculations are important. In fact, one can say that the mole is the currency of chemistry. When we think about the forms in which substances are found in a normal chemical reaction, the states typically include pure solids, pure liquids, aqueous solutions, and gases. You'll need to know how to derive the number of moles of a substance in any of these states. This mole conversion diagram addresses the most basic mole calculations, which are used when a substance, like an element or compound, is present in the solid state. Let's address how to calculate moles if a substance is found as a pure liquid or as an aqueous solution. Liquids are typically measured by volume. Therefore, the mass of a pure liquid can be determined from its density. Once the mass of a liquid is known, it's easy to determine the moles present, which we can see by adding this to our diagram. Density will act as our bridge between volume and mass of a pure substance. To find mass, we'll take the density times volume. And to find volume, we'll divide a substance's mass by its density. For example, if a 5.50 cm cubed sample of methanol is used in an experiment, and the density of methanol is found to be 0.7866 grams per cm cubed at 25 degrees Celsius, how many moles of methanol were used? Since we're converting from the volume of a pure liquid into moles, We'll first convert from volume into mass using density, then into moles using the substance's molar mass. With the density equation, we can plug in our known density and volume to find the mass of methanol used in our sample. The molar mass of methanol is 32.04 grams per mole, meaning that one mole of methanol weighs 32.04 grams. We'll divide our substance's mass by its molar mass to find the moles of methanol in the sample. This works because methanol is a pure liquid, which allows us to use density to relate volume and mass. For an aqueous solution, we'll need to take a different approach. Recall the basics of solutions, which are composed of a solute dissolved in a solvent, which is generally water, thus the term aqueous. In an aqueous solution of, say, sodium chloride, we have a substance that is composed mostly of water, the solvent, with sodium and chloride ions dispersed uniformly throughout as the solute. Because an aqueous solution of sodium chloride is mostly water, the determination of the number of moles of sodium chloride present requires a method different from what we've previously used. We must incorporate the concept of solution concentration into our calculation. Solution concentration, or molarity, is defined as the moles of solute per volume of solution. Mathematically, we represent this as a lowercase c equals n over v, that is, moles divided by volume of solution in decimeters cubed. Molarity will therefore have the units of moles per decimeter cubed. From this equation, we can see that in order to determine the number of moles present in an aqueous solution, we must rearrange the equation to make moles equal to molarity times volume. We'll add this to our mole diagram as well. Molarity acts as the bridge between the volume of solution and moles. To convert from solution volume into moles, we would multiply volume by concentration. In the other direction, converting from moles into solution volume, we would divide moles by concentration. Remember, using a diagram like this can help you build mental maps that guide you through unit conversions. If you haven't done so already, I would highly suggest adding something like this to your notes in an easily accessible area.
let's take a look at a problem that involves an aqueous solution in which it's necessary to determine the number of moles, and explain why we can't use density in that calculation. A 350 centimeter cube sample of glucose solution has a concentration of 0.0750 moles per decimeter cubed. What is the mass of glucose in this sample? Since we're converting from volume into mass, we'll need to convert from volume of solution into moles first using molarity, and then from moles into mass using molar mass. This can sometimes be a place of high confusion. Many students at this point may try and solve this problem using density. So why can't we use density here? If we calculate mass using density, we need to identify what we're actually taking the mass of. Say we know the density of the glucose solution, and after multiplying it by the solution's volume, we find that it has a mass of 353.5 grams. That seems like a lot, and it is because that's the mass of the entire solution, meaning it's the mass of mostly water. Finding this would be like placing the solution on a scale after adjusting for the weight of the beaker. This is perfectly fine if we want to know the mass of a pure liquid. But if we're trying to find the mass of just the glucose dissolved in the solution, we'll have to reference the concentration of the glucose in the solution. Remember that we use moles as a way to count molecules in bulk. Having concentration measured as molarity gives us a ratio of counted molecules to volume of solution. If we plug in our numbers, making sure to convert volume into decimeters cubed, we can use this ratio to find the total moles of glucose in the solution sample. We've used concentration to separate information about glucose from the solution. We'll then compare the moles of glucose to its molar mass, that is the mass of one mole of glucose, and determine its total mass in solution. Our answer here is much smaller than before, which should make sense. Solutions are mostly water, so the amount dissolved will usually be much smaller than the total mass. The final of the most common states in which matter will appear in a chemical equation is the gas state. Because particles of a gas are widespread, separated from one another, and constantly moving, the pressure, temperature, and volume of a sample of gas all contribute to the determination of the number of moles present in the sample. This concept is covered in greater detail with the ideal gas law and ideal gas law calculations. But if temperature and pressure are held constant throughout a chemical reaction, the volume in which the gases are contained will be directly proportional to the number of moles of gas present. This is stated by Avogadro's law, which states that equal volumes of gases under identical conditions will have the same number of particles. This was discussed in a previous video along with the definition of the mole. In line with this observation, we can use the mole relationship found in the balanced chemical equation to predict the moles or even volume of a gas produced or consumed within a reaction. We can do this so long as we know at least one of the gases molar or volume measurements beforehand and that the temperature and pressure remain constant. Let's quickly take a look at this using the reaction equation below for the Haber process. If 5.5 moles of hydrogen are reacted with excess nitrogen, how many moles of ammonia, NH3, will be produced if the temperature and pressure are held constant? The molar amounts remain proportional as temperature and pressure do not change, meaning we can use our 3 to 2 mole ratio between hydrogen and ammonia as our conversion factor. This ratio corresponds with how these compounds will be consumed and produced and tells us that 3.7 moles of ammonia will be made when 5.5 moles of hydrogen are allowed to react in excess nitrogen. Similarly, we can do this with volumes of gases. If 10 decimeters cubed of nitrogen reacts with hydrogen, what volume of hydrogen gas is needed if the temperature and pressure remain constant? Instead of using moles, we can represent the reaction ratios within the equation using volume. This allows us to solve the problem just as before, where we can use our reaction ratio between nitrogen and hydrogen to find the volume of gas needed. We see that for every one decimeter cubed of nitrogen that's reacted, we need three decimeters cubed of hydrogen. So 10 decimeter cubed of nitrogen gas will require 30 decimeters cubed of hydrogen gas. In summary, the mole is used as a way to count large quantities of particles. And as such, there are many practical applications for the mole in chemistry. For example, we can break down and identify molecular and empirical formulas using mole ratios within compounds. 
We could also find the mass, concentration, and volume of a pure substance and of a solution using either density or molarity. And we can even use Avogadro's law to find quantities and volumes of gases using ratios within chemical equations. Each of these represents a practical lab skill for IB chemistry students, making it essential to not only understand the concept of the mole, but also its many applications.